friends, Miss Rosenfield here. Um, I am going to read you the section of the Land of the Dead and the Sirens from the Odyssey. So we are in volume two of your textbook. And I am reading from page 576 to 582 for this section. So unfortunately, our particular textbook skips over some really interesting parts of the Odyssey here. So I'm gonna uh, summarize those for you before I begin reading. So um, the first place that it kind of gets skipped over is right after they leave Polyphemus the Cyclops, Odysseus and his men get to Aeolia, which as you can see in this picture is um, basically a floating island. And there's a golden castle there and King Aeolus who has 12 sons and daughters and he has married them all to each other and they're all very beautiful. And he is the king of the winds. Like Zeus controls storms, but Aeolus controls the winds specifically. So Odysseus asks him for help getting home and King Aeolus gets a giant bag and he stuffs in all the winds except the west wind. So Odysseus and his men need to go west to get home to Ithaca and um, he leaves the west wind out, so that will be the one blowing them home. And all the other winds are stuck in this bag so that they can't blow them off course. So they take the bag with them and they row towards home and they are almost home. They can see Ithaca for the first time in like 11 or 12 years. And Odysseus sees that they're about to get home. So he says, I wanna take a nap. He lays down to go to sleep and the crew sees this bag which he hasn't told them has wind in it he hasn't informed them about what's going on so they know that they were just at this very rich place and he they think that the king has given odysseus a bag of treasure and they think that odysseus is keeping all the treasure for himself so they open the bag to try and divvy up what they think is treasure and all the wind comes out of the bag and there's a giant storm and the ship is about to tip over and when it finally writes and the storm calms down, they realize they are all the way back at Aeolia. So Odysseus goes back to King Aeolus and says, this happened, could you help me please? And Aeolus says, no way. If you came all the way back here after being so close to home, Zeus must really hate you and I would be stupid to get in between you and Zeus. So he just sends him on his way and there's nothing more that he does to help him. So that's really frustrating for Odysseus <clears throat> and his men. Um, the next place they go is the land of the Lastragonians. So whenever they land someplace, Odysseus sends out some sailors to go see what's going on. And the two that he sends to the Lastragonians don't come back. It turns out the Lastragonians are giants and cannibals and they eat the men right away. And so then they realize that the men must have come from ships, much like Polyphemus realized that. And they go out to shore and see all Odysseus's ships there. And they start taking giant boulders and throwing them at the ships to sink them so that they can eat the sailors. And you can see <clears throat> in the top picture that they're throwing boulders. And in the bottom one, they're like smashing people against rocks. And then they would eat them. <coughs> in this spot, all of the ships sink except for the one that Odysseus is on. So he's lost all of his other ships at this point and every other sailor except the ones on his boat. So it's a big loss for him. Not much else happens at the Lastragonians. That's pretty much it. The next place, oh, excuse me. While this is going on, he's having his adventures. Um, Penelope, his queen and wife, is back on Ithaca. Now, when the Trojan War started, Odysseus took all the youngish, strong men at that time to the Trojan War to fight with him. And we know that all of those men either died in the Trojan War or are in the process of dying on the Odyssey on the way home. So there's this whole generation of men that was completely wiped out from Ithaca, and their children have grown up into young men now, and they want to... Uh, take the throne. So Odysseus hasn't been home in 12, 13 years. It doesn't seem like he's coming home. Everyone else who survived the Trojan War is has gotten home or has been definitively killed by now, and they haven't heard anything from Odysseus. So they're like, listen, your king is gone. You should marry one of us, and one of us should be the king of Ithaca. Penelope doesn't want to do this. She loves Odysseus, and she doesn't believe that he's dead yet. 
So she it also is very tricky and she tries to hold the suitors off. Um, one of the things she does to trick them is she starts weaving. So you can see in this painting, um, she's the one kind of looking sad because she's missing Odysseus. Um, and in front of her is a loom and her father-in-law, Odysseus's dad, Laertes, is pretty old and they think he's probably gonna die soon. So what she's weaving is a, sh a funeral shroud, which is like a cover that goes over someone when they die. And she tells the suitors, okay, I'll choose one of you, um, but first I need to weave this funeral shroud for my father-in-law. I wouldn't feel right if he died and I hadn't finished it or I had married someone else before. So let me finish this and then I will choose one of you to marry. And this tricks them for a while. They say, okay, sounds good. And during the day, she makes a big show of doing her weaving. But then at night, secretly, she is uh, undoing all her progress and picking out her threads. So she does this for about three years. She's able to keep them off by looking like she's weaving, but actually not making any progress. Uh, during this time, Telemachus, who is Odysseus and Penelope's son, get so fed up with the suitors, eating all their sheep, drinking all their wine, harassing his mom, that he says enough. And he goes out to try and find news of Odysseus. So this is this section of the Odyssey. Um, we don't read it in our textbook, but it's called Telemachus's Quest. And he goes off to ask friends of his father's if they've seen Odysseus, other men who fought in the Trojan War. And while he's out, the suitors make a plan to try and kill him because he's the crown prince of Ithaca. So if he's dead, it would be a lot easier for one of them to take the throne and become king. But luckily for Odysseus and his family, Athena is the goddess that kind of watches over their family and she keeps the suitors from killing Telemachus. So that's going on during all of Odysseus's adventures. That's what's happening at home in Ithaca. And we also know that that's happening because there's been foreshadowing, right? Polyphemus prayed to Poseidon um, to make Odysseus's homecoming troublesome in some way, and we knew that was gonna happen. After Odysseus and his men leave the land of the Lastragonians and he has only one ship left, he um, lands near Circe is her name, and she is a powerful immortal. Um, some texts call her a witch, but that doesn't really convey how powerful she is. She's like one tier below a goddess, and some, some sources call her a goddess. So her thing is that she has a magic and she can brew potions that turn men into animals if they drink them. So in this famous painting of her, you can see Odysseus, uh, his ship is in the background and she's holding a bottle of the magic potion and next to her are panthers, which we are meant to assume are men. So this is an illusion. It's a reference to something we already know. You're meant to understand the Odyssey and know that those panthers are men. She's turned into animals. So when Odysseus sends out his runners at Circe's Island, they don't come back because she has given them this potion and turned them into pigs. Um, so Odysseus goes to try and find them. And on his way to Circe's castle, Hermes, who is the messenger god, stops him and tells him who Circe is and what's about to happen. And he gives Odysseus this plant that um, will counteract the effects of the magic potion. So if he eats it, then her magic won't work on him. So he does, he takes Hermes' advice and eats the plant. And when Circe gives him the potion, he drinks it, but it doesn't do anything to him. And then he fights back and she's surprised by this. So he gains the upper hand and makes her turn his men, makes her turn his men who were pigs back into humans. Um, <clears throat> And then they're not mad at each other. And he hangs out with Cersei and holds hand with her for a year. And there are other women there. So his men are happy to stay there too. <clears throat> After about a year, his men say that it's probably time we go home, right, Captain? Not even Odysseus, just his sailors. And so he asks Cersei for her help in getting back home because he's obviously had so much trouble. And she tells him that he needs to go to the land of the dead. There is um, a spirit there who used to be a blind prophet named Tiresias, and he can tell Odysseus what he needs to do to get home safely. So his crew is heading towards the land of the dead where we pick up this section. And this is um, uh, a section where he meets several different people who we know already from the story or who are tangentially related to the story. 
And then he gets a prophecy about what's about to happen for him. Kind of like an if then, if you do this and this will happen, if you do this, this will happen. So there are really specific rules to going to the land of the dead. So he needs to follow those rules and rituals in order to talk to the spirits there. So I'm about to pick up on page 576 under the land of the dead. I'm not gonna read that blue section because that's what I just summarized for you. Um, so I'm starting uh, right under that blue section. <clears throat> We bore down on the ship at the sea's edge and launched her on the salt and mortal sea, stepping our mast and spar in the black ship, embarked the ram and you and went aboard in tears with bitter and sore dread upon us. So he's bringing sheep to sacrifice there and they're also really scared. <laughs> but now a breeze came up for us astern, a canvas bellying land breeze, hail shipmate sent by the singing nymph with sun bright hair. So we made fast the braces, took our thwarts, and let the wind and steersmen work the ship with full sail spread all day above our coursing, till the sun dipped and all the ways grew dark upon the fathomless unresting sea. By night our ship ran onward toward the ocean's born, the realm and region of the men of winter, hidden in mist and cloud. Never the flaming eye of Helios lights on those men at morning, when he climbs the sky's stars, nor in descending earthward out of heaven, ruinous night being rove over those wretches. So he's describing the land of the dead. It's always nighttime there. There's no sun, no daytime. We made the land, put Ram and you ashore, and took our way along the ocean stream to find the place foretold for us by Circe. There, Perimides and Eurolochus pinioned the sacred beast. With my drawn blade, I spaded up the votive pit and poured libations round it to the unnumbered dead. Sweet milk and honey, then sweet wine, and last clear water, and I scattered barley down. So he's dug a pit. And there are spirits, dead spirits coming toward him. And he's got these sheep that he's about to slaughter and he's handing out drinks to the dead. It's um, like a sacrifice he has to do so that they don't kill him and that he can get what he wants. So he gives them wine and water and honey and milk. Um, and I am on line 555 on page 577. Then I addressed the blurred and breathless dead, bowing to slaughter my best heifer for them before she calved at home in Ithaca and burn the choice bits on the altar fire. As for Tiresias, I swore to sacrifice a black lamb, handsomest of all our flock. So he's promising sacrifices he'll give to them if they help him out. Thus to assuage the nations of the dead, I pledged these rites, then slashed the lamb in you, letting their black blood stream into the well pit. Now the souls gathered, stirring out of Erebus, brides and young men, and men grown old in pain, and tender girls whose hearts were new to grief, Many were there too, torn by brazen lance heads, battle slain, bearing still their bloody gear. From every side they came and sought the pit with rustling cries, and I grew sick with fear. But presently I gave command to my officers to flay those sheep the bronze cut down and make burnt offerings of flesh to the gods below, to sovereign death, to pale Persephone. Meanwhile, I crouched with my drawn sword to keep the surging phantoms from the bloody pit till I should know the presence of Tiresias. So he's dug this pit, he killed the ram and you, the sheep, and drained their blood into this pit. So there's like a pit of blood that all the spirits are coming towards, and Odysseus is standing over it with his sword out to keep them away because he needs to let Tiresias drink from it first, and then the other ones come. <clears throat> One shade came first, Elpinor of our company, who lay unburied still on the wide earth as we had left him, dead in Circe's hall, untouched, unmourned, when other cares compelled us. So um, he sees one of his sailors who's dead now, who died while they were at Circe's and they didn't bury him properly. So he's about to complain about that. Now, when I saw him there, I wept for pity and called out to him, how is this Elpinor? How could you journey to the Western gloom swifter afoot than I in the black lugger? Meaning, what are you doing here? He sighed and answered, son of great Laertes, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier. So there's another epithet, Odysseus, and then a descriptive phrase of his name, Odysseus, master mariner and soldier. Bad luck shadowed me and no kindly power. Ignoble death I drank with so much wine. I slept on Circe's roof, then could not see the long steep backward ladder coming down and fell that height. My neck bone buckled under, snapped, and my spirit found this well of dark. Now hear the grace I pray for in the name of those back in the world, not here, your wife and father, he who gave you bread in childhood and your only child, your, your own child, your only son Telemachus long ago left at home. So this guy, Elpinor, got too drunk on Circe's roof and he couldn't find the ladder down and he fell and broke his neck. 
and they didn't bury him. So he's about to ask Odysseus to please bury him when he goes back to the land of the living. Um, and I'm on page 578, line 598. When you make sail and put those lodgings of dim death behind, you will moor ship, I know, upon Aea Island. There, O oh my Lord, remember me, I pray. Do not abandon me unwept, unburied, to tempt the gods' wrath while you sail for home. But fire my corpse and all the gear I had, and build a cairn for me above the breakers, an unknown sailor's mark for men to come. Keep up the mound there, and implant upon it the ore I pulled in life with my companions. He ceased, and I replied, unhappy spirit, I promise you the barrow and the burial. So Odysseus is agreeing that he will bury him properly when he goes back to the land of the living. So we conversed, and grimly at a distance, with my long sword between, guarding the blood, while the faint image of the lad spoke on. Now came the soul of Anticlea, dead, my mother, daughter of Atolicus, dead now, though living still when I took ship for holy Troy. Seeing this ghost I grieved, but held her off, through pang on pang of tears, till I should know the presence of Tiresias. So Anticlea is Odysseus's mother, and she was alive when he left. So he didn't know that she was dead. Seeing her there is a surprise to him. And she um, actually killed herself because Odysseus never came home. So it's his fault that she's there and dead. And he wants to talk to her, but he can't talk to her first. He needs to let Tiresias drink the blood first. <clears throat> and I'm on line 620 now. Soon from the dark, that prince of thieves came forward, bearing a golden staff, and he addressed me. Son of Laertes and the gods of old, Odysseus, master of landways and seaways, why leave the blazing sun, O man of woe, to see the cold dead in the joyless region? Stand clear, put up your sword, let me but taste of blood, I shall speak true. At this I stepped aside, and in the scabbard let my long sword ring home to the pommel silver, as he bent down to the somber blood. Then he spoke the prince of those with gift of speech. So in this painting here on this slide, um, Odysseus is in the lower right hand corner where my face is covering him, kind of sorry. And you can see his sword um, next to the sheep that he's slaughtered and the sheep's blood is going into that pit. And he was using the sword to hold off the other spirits, but now he's letting Tiresias drink the blood. And then Tiresias is going to make this prophecy, predict what's going to happen for Odysseus. Um, and I'm at the break at the top of page 579. Great captain, a fair wind and the honey lights of home are all you seek, but anguish lies ahead. The God who thunders on the land prepares it, not to be shaken from your track, implacable, in rancor for the sun whose eye you blinded. So we got some foreshadowing here. This whole thing is foreshadowing, actually. He's telling him, look, you made, a, you made Poseidon mad not to, so now Poseidon's after you. One narrow strait may take you through his blows, denial of yourself, restraint of shipmates, um, so he has to go through this really dangerous part in the ocean to get past Poseidon. When you make landfall in Thrinacia, first and quit the violet sea, dark on the land you'll find the grazing herds of Helios, by whom all things are seen, all speech is known. Avoid those kind, hold fast to your intent, and hard seafaring brings you all to Ithaca. So then you're going to go to the land of Helios, the sun god, and he has special cattle there that no one's allowed to eat. And if your crew leaves them alone and respects the sun god, then you will all get home safely. Uh, but that's not going to happen. Uh, line 645. But if you raid the beeves, if you eat the cattle, I see destruction for ship and crew. Though you survive alone, bereft of all companions, lost for years, under strange sail shall you come home to find your own house filled with trouble, insolent men eating your livestock as they court your lady. Aye, you shall make those men atone in blood. But after you have dealt out death in open combat or by stealth <clears throat> to all the suitors, go over land on foot and take an oar until one day you come to where men have lived with meat unsalted, never known the sea, nor seen seagoing ships with crimson bows and oars that fledge light halls for dipping flight. So Tiresias tells him, if your men eat the cattle, which we pretty much know they're going to because he spends a lot more time talking about that then all of them are going to die because they will have upset the sun god and you will eventually make it home but it will be on a ship that's not yours all on your own with lots of years in between and you will have to deal with men there who are trying to steal your wife which we know is true um, and i'm towards the bottom of 579 on line 659 right now so he's saying um here's what you got to do since your men are going to eat this cattle, 
you're going to upset the gods even further. And when you finally make it home and you kill all these suitors, then you're gonna to have to make this really big sacrifice to the gods. So you'll have to walk really far inland until people have never even heard of the ocean. They don't even know what a paddle is. And there you'll make a large sacrifice to the gods. And if you do that all correctly, then you will actually be able to live out to old age in peace. The spot will soon be plain to you. So the spot where he should sacrifice. And I can tell you how. Some passerby will say, what winnowing fan is that upon your shoulder? So people won't know what a paddle is. They'll think it's something for a threshing grain. Halt and implant your smooth ore in the turf and make fair sacrifice to Lord Poseidon. A ram, a bull, a great buck boar. Turn back and carry out pure hecatombs at home to all wide heaven's lords, the undying gods, to each in order. Then a seaborn death, soft as this hand of mist, will come upon you when you are wearied out with rich old age, your country folk in blessed peace around you. All this shall be just as I foretell. Um, and so that sort of closes out the section of the land of the dead because he's gotten everything he needs to know from Tiresias. And he sees some more interesting things there, uh, but it's not as pertinent to the story. <clears throat> so if you flip the page to page 580, the short little section about the sirens is um, the next stop and one of the three really big dangers to do with the ocean because he's upset Poseidon. So the first is the sirens, um, and that's what this painting is of. And then there's Scylla and Charybdis. <clears throat> Scylla is a hydra, so one of those monsters with six heads, and she is going to eat some of his men. And then there's Charybdis, who's a whirlpool, and it's giant, and it has these like big rocks that are like teeth in it. Um, and to get past where they need to go, they have to sail between Scylla the Hydra and Charybdis the Whirlpool. And um, Odysseus doesn't tell his men that that's going to happen because it's too scary. But he does tell them about the sirens, which is the first ocean danger that they need to go by. Now, the sirens are, um, they have this magic that they live on an island by themselves and from a distance, they look like beautiful women and they sing this beautiful song that entrances people. It's like a spell. And if you hear the song, then you have to go to their island. It's involuntary, like you're not even in control anymore. And once sailors get to the island, then they kill them and eat them, I think. So when Odysseus knows that this is gonna happen, Circe tells him how to get by there safely because pretty much all sailors in history, except for just a few, whenever they sail past, they hear the song, they go to the island, and they get killed. <clears throat> so Odysseus gets told by Circe to put beeswax in his men's ear so that they can't hear the song at all, so the magic doesn't affect them. And he wants to hear the song. So he has them tie him to the mast, which is the picture that you see on this painting here. His crew has like head wraps so they can't hear, and he's tied to the mast. And he's told them, no matter how much I scream and beg, don't untie me and don't row towards the sirens. And um, they follow his advice. And with the sirens, what's being shown in this painting, when you get close to them, they're not beautiful anymore. They turn into monsters. And um, a lot of times they're depicted with female heads and then like eagle bodies. And that's what this painting is showing here. So Odysseus gets to hear the song, but his men don't, and they row him safely past. So this is the siren section that I'm about to read, page 580. As Circe spoke, Dawn mounted her golden throne. There's Dawn being personified again. And on the first rays, Circe left me, taking her way like a great goddess up the island. There's a simile comparing Circe to a goddess, which she's really close to, but not quite. I made straight for the ship, roused up the men to get aboard, and cast off at the stern. They scrambled to their places by the row locks and all in line dipped oars in the gray sea. But soon an offshore breeze blew to our liking, a canvas bellying breeze, a lusty shipmate sent by the singing nymph with sun bright hair. So we made fast the braces and we rested, letting the wind and steersmen work the ship. The crew being now silent before me, I addressed them, sore at heart. So he's about to tell them what's coming up. Dear friends, more than one man or two should know those things that Circe foresaw for us and shared with me. So let me tell her forecast. Then we die with our eyes open, if we are going to die, or know what death we baffle if we can. Sirens weaving a haunting song over the sea we are to shun, she said, and their green shore all sweet with clover. 
So he tells them, I want you to know what we're going up against, which is kind of manipulative of him because he doesn't tell them about Scylla and Charybdis, which are coming up next. So Cersei, he says, Cersei says, we're going to hear their song and we're going to want to go to them. We're going to see their beautiful island. We're going to want to go there, but we can't. Yet she urged that I alone should listen to their song. Therefore, you are to tie me up, tight as a splint, erect along the mast, lashed to the mast. And if I shout and beg to be untied, take more turns of the rope to muffle me. I rather dwelt on this part of the forecast, while our good ship made time, bound outward down the wind for the strange island of Sirens. Then all at once the wind fell, and a calm came over all the sea, as though some power lulled the swell. The crew were on their feet briskly, to furl the sail and stow it then. Each in place, they poised the smooth oar blades and sent the white foam scudding by. I carved a massive cake of beeswax into bits and rolled them in my hands until they softened. So he's taking wax to put in his crew's ear so that they can't hear the song. No long task, for a burning heat came down from Helios, Lord of High Noon. Going forward, I carried wax along the line and laid it thick on their ears. They tied me up then, plumb amidships, back to the mast, lashed to the mast, and took themselves again to rowing. So he's about to um, tell us what the siren song sounded like. <clears throat> I'm on line 517. Soon, as we came smartly within hailing distance, the two sirens, noting our fast ship off their point, made ready, and they sang, This way, O turn your bows, Achaea's glory, as all the world allows, more and be merry. Sweet coupled airs we sing, no lonely seafarer holds clear of entering our green mirror. Pleased by each purling note like honey twining from her throat and my throat, who lies a pining? Sea rovers here take joy voyaging onward. As from our song of Troy, graybeard and rower boy goeth more learned. All feats on that great field in the long warfare, dark days the bright gods willed, wounds you bore there. Argos' old soldiery on Troy beach teeming, charmed out of time we see, no life on earth can be hid from our dreaming. So it's a song of the sirens and Odysseus is like screaming to his men to let them uh, go over there so that he can hold hands with these beautiful women. But his crew does what he says initially and keeps him tied up, ties him up even tighter and just keeps rowing past. Um, I'm line 745 at the bottom of page 582. The lovely voices and ardor appealing over the water made me crave to listen. And I tried to say, untie me to the crew, jerking my brows but they bent steady to the oars. Then Perimides got to his feet, he and Eurolochus, and passed more line about to hold me still. So all rode on until the sirens dropped me under the sea room and their singing dwindled away. My faithful company rested on their oars now, peeling off the wax I had laid thick on their ears, then set me free. So they get safely past the sirens, thanks to Circe, who told them exactly what to do. Um, and then the next thing they'll have to do is Scylla and Charybdis, which is still Poseidon trying to kill them for blinding Polyphemus. So that is the land of the dead and the sirens. Uh, we ended on page 583. And uh, next you will see Scylla and Charybdis. <laughs>